Welcome to Dear Prudence. I'm your Prudence, Janae Desmond Harris. Today, we'll be answering letters about when to quote unquote cancel a bad boss, what to do when it feels like nobody cares about spreading germs anymore, and whether daycare and slumber parties are sending kids into trauma. Here to help me out is Ellie Mistal, an attorney and writer who's the nation's justice correspondent. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution. And I've been following him and his work for so many years since he wrote for Above the Law when I was a miserable law firm attorney. So maybe that will come up, maybe not. Either way, thank you for all your work and thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Janae. I am so excited to be here because, you know, if, you know, if you're a lawyer, you, you like giving some, some unsolicited advice, right? Like the advice that they solicit from you are usually by like impossibly rich people with impossibly first world, world problems. Right. That's what you got to pay me for. But for this, this is just free stuff and I'm happy to participate. And you can just say whatever you want and be irresponsible and no one can disbar you or anything. Exactly. Don't have, don't have to follow the Sydney Powell rules today. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get started, I want to give you a chance to give our listeners one piece of unsolicited advice. Yes. So usually I just go with don't ever go to law school, which mm. is true, but has a kind of limited purpose. So what I would like to lead with today is argue often especially with your friends, especially with your spouses. Like, you don't have to be mean. And, you know, I'm not saying, like, you know, everything has to be an, an Eminem song. But, like, <laughs> argue often because in argument, you're going to learn something. You're going to move forward. You're going to build your relationship. I hear all these people who say, like, oh, me and my partner, we never fight. What the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> I fight with my wife all the time about, like, you know, whether or not we should go to the bake sale or the apple picking, right? Like <laughs> argument is where, you know, thoughts are expressed and ideas are put forward. And so, you know, d don't take the easy way out. I like to argue. I think argument is healthy for a strong relationship. You're also really good at arguing. And my wife's a lawyer too. So it's not like I, I just roll over her or anything, right? Like, I wish I, I could roll over her sometimes. <laughs> um, does, doesn't really work out that way for me. Okay, well, I'm going to take that seriously. Um, as I'm always saying on this podcast, I have to admit I'm non-confrontational. I do not like the feeling of arguing, but I hear what you're saying, and maybe I'll try it out. You learn a lot, and it's ha to me, it's a, it's a great way to kind of like move forward. There are things, even to this day, you know, I've been married for 19 years, that I still learn about myself, to mm -hmm. say nothing about learning about my, my, my partner um, through argument, through confrontation, through disagreement. Okay, last thing. How are you at admitting when someone else has won the argument? Oh, oh. <laughs> I feel like your face oh. just changed and I saw, I saw this. <laughs> <laughs> admitting is a strong word. Mm -hmm. I, 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 can, I can take an L. I can okay. take an L and I can, can kind of go with the will of the council, if you, if you will. Um, I am, I, I think, and I, my wife, I'm sure, would say, I am less good at saying those exact, I was wrong, you were mm -hmm. right words. Um, I struggle with the mm -hmm. hands. Um, but I certainly, like, I, I can take the L and I can, I, that's, and I think that's the other thing about, like, what I'm saying about argument. Like, it works for me and my wife. It works for me and my friends because, like, we move on afterwards, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, the, the arguments are kind of, self-contained and don't linger um and then it's like all right well yes it's apple picking okay <laughs> <laughs> well with that ellie and i will dive into your questions after a short break can't get enough dear prudence then you should definitely join slate plus slate's membership program you'll get to hear me answer an extra question every week just for members with your subscription, you get ad-free listening across the Slate network and unlimited reading on the Slate site, including all Dear Prudence columns, past and present. Go to slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. Again, that's slate.com forward slash Prudy Plus. Welcome back. You're listening to Dear Prudence, and I'm here with Ellie Mistal. Let's get started with our first letter, Odd Man Out. Mm -hmm. 
My husband and I have been married for 10 years. My stepdaughter, 24, is getting married next year. Our relationship has had its ups and downs over the years. My relationship with my husband began as an extramarital affair, which I'm not proud of. We all lived in the same town, and my children and my stepchildren attended the same schools. The affair became public, and the situation was painful and embarrassing for everyone. We have apologized, and I thought we were past all of that. But now my stepdaughter says she does not want me to attend the wedding. My husband wants to go anyway. I want him to put his foot down and tell her that he will not attend without me. I'm not sure how it will work out. So I don't want to come off as a a cheating scold here. I live in the world. I read hundreds of letters about people's messy lives every week. I know infidelity is common. I know that while it's bad and unfortunate, it's not the worst thing in the entire world. It doesn't make you the devil. In fact, controversial opinion, I think some relationships need to end and infidelity can be the way out. That said, you cannot expect to engage in infidelity and not experience any negative consequences. Like that's not the deal. In exchange for getting the person you want to be with, you might get judgment. You might get embarrassment. You might get distance from those around you. And yes, you might not be welcome at certain weddings. I don't know. What do you think? Oh, uh, look, I, first of all, when the lady says, I thought we were past this, right. yeah, you thought wrong. <laughs> right? You were incorrect in that right. assumption, obviously. Um, I'm really focused on the wedding aspect because the it, it, it bothers me because the idea from this letter is that the wedding is about her and mm-hmm. it ain't. Right. It's about the kids. It's about the daughter. You don't get to invite yourself to nobody's wedding, right? You don't right. get to make that day about you. And why and would yes, you want to? Right? Like, look, and the idea that you, who, again, had this extramarital relationship, are going to come to the daughter's wedding where the daughter's mother is going to be there. Are you kidding me? Right. And then you want to say, like, no, you're, the, the girl's father can't show. Come on. Like, come on. Right? right. So, look. I, you were talking about the realness of the world. I have experienced that too. I forget which wife or girlfriend my father was on at the time that I got married. Like I, I, I had lost count wow. by that point, but he didn't bring the woman to my wedding mm. with my mother. Right? right. And you know what? I didn't have to ask him. He, he was able to figure that out on his damn own to not sense. bring some other woman to the wedding where my mother was going to be sitting there. So I, I, I think this is an easy question. I think that her problem is that she's making this about her yep. when it's really not. Absolutely. Um, and you're so right about, I thought we were past that. I mean, <laughs> that's something you say for like, I spilled a glass of red wine on your white couch and I apologized <laughs> and, and paid for it to be cleaned. And now we're past that. You don't get past taking part in tearing up someone's family. And don't get me wrong. The dad is the one who's really to blame, right? He's the one who violated his marital vows. He's the one who owed his daughter and his wife something. But life is not fair. And she loves her dad. She doesn't love you. That's just the way it is. She wants her dad at her wedding. There are people who get past that, but it's all, it's their decision when they're past that. Not right. your decision when you're – it's her decision when she's past that. She's obviously past it enough with her father that she wants her father at the wedding. She doesn't want her stepmom at the wedding. That is her call. And again, think about how unpleasant it would be to know that you forced your way in. And you're sitting there knowing that um, the daughter and all all of her friends don't like you. The wife and her friends don't like you. Your husband is uncomfortable because you've forced him to make an ultimatum so that he can have you there. And for what? Is this wedding going to be the event of the year? Like, you know what's going to happen, right? You'll watch them say <laughs> vows. You'll like eat some food. You may dance to a few songs. You're not missing out on an all-expense paid trip to Europe at an all-inclusive resort. It's a <laughs> wedding. It's like six hours, and it's not that great. And again, it's just it's not your six hours, right? It's hers. It like it, and it's it, it's so I think simple. I, there's a whole other thing where like people, at, at kind of as you're getting to where where people act like you know going to a wedding is like that time where you bring the date where you test it. Like, no, that you should go to the wedding in the most anodyne way possible Mm -hmm. to just sit there and clap and celebrate for whoever invited you. Don't bring any extra drama to their day. Their day is, trust me, stressful damn enough. 
right? right? Just just be there, clap, eat your food with your you know, chew with your mouth closed, and try <laughs> not to be a problem. Right. And since the letter writer is someone um, who's inclined to center herself, I would advise her, don't pressure your husband about this. Don't tell him you have to bring me, you have to say that you won't go, let him go without you. And I'll give you sort of the the selfish angle on that. You want your spouse to have a relationship with his kid. You don't want your spouse to skip his kid's wedding. His connection to her and his happiness is like one ingredient in your collective emotional well-being as a couple. And it's actually not in your interest to like take that away from him. I completely agree. I would also say just as a parent, n- never make me choose between my kids and something else. Right. Never. Right. Because that that's never a choice you want to be on the other side. Of. Right. I mean, yeah, right? don't like, do it to yourself. Right. That, that's, that's, that's not, that's not the path to happiness. Right. <laughs> you got you, the, if, if the father has mended relationships enough with his daughter, that his daughter wants him at her wedding, that is their deal. And she doesn't have an, in, she doesn't have an into that. I would go so far as to say this. If the daughter doesn't want her action, if she was the actual biological, you know, radio mother and the daughter didn't want her at the wedding, then she shouldn't go to the wedding. Mm-hmm. Right. Like again, cause it's, it's, it's not about the parent. It's about the person who is getting married. Exactly. Give them their day. Yeah. Skip the day. Um, go do something nice for yourself. Call a friend. Your husband will be home in like six to eight hours and everyone can move on. Right. And maybe this is the indication that you have more mending to do. Yeah. With your stepchildren. Yeah. May- maybe it's an indication <laughs> that we aren't past that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Important piece of information. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Our next question is titled, To Cancel or Not? I work for a social justice organization. A few years ago, a colleague of mine, Brad, whom I was somewhat friends with, was canceled very publicly for an offensive social media post he had written long before he had joined the organization and had no longer even remembered writing. Many argued that this colleague should be forgiven because they were clearly no longer that kind of person or held those beliefs. His semi-supervisor, John, disagreed, however, and took pleasure in publicly humiliating him, even denigrating him to the media and eventually successfully getting him fired. Cut to now. I recently discovered that John has a pretty awful skeleton in his own closet. Like Brad, he had penned a highly offensive social media post years back before he joined the organization. Moreover, this post is way worse than Brad's ever was, and actually targets Brad's ethnic minority group. I had always wondered about John's over-the-top, unprofessional behavior towards Brad during his public demise, and now I've seemingly discovered why. My question is, do I now try and cancel John? I am of two minds about this. On the one hand, John's social media post is genuinely horrible, and I don't think he has changed for the better since he wrote it. He continues to criticize this ethnic group, albeit always just skirting being obviously racist. I'm afraid he will never be held accountable if I don't alert the media or others about this. I can't deny either that how he treated Brad was infuriating and frightening, And the discovery of this social media post proves what a hypocrite he is. He is also often sanctimonious and acts like the moral voice of our organization. So, part of me feels that exposing him would be karma. But on the other hand, I've always been against cancel culture. At least if it's clear that the person has already changed for the better. He hasn't, but still. Would exposing him make me a moral hypocrite too? I would also have to try to expose him anonymously, because doing so openly might jeopardize my job. My spouse says not to, that nothing is ever anonymous, but the thought of him getting away with it infuriates me. What should I do? So I was trying to figure out what bothered me so much about this letter, and I think it's that it seems to be from a person who took the sort of long and insufferable debate we all had on the internet about cancel culture a few five years ago and just took all the wrong lessons from it um 
Like they have clearly defined quote unquote canceling as a bad, unfair thing that happens to someone who used to be bad and is now good and doesn't deserve it. It's a gotcha where an innocent person who is a bit of a bigot, just like, you know, everyone used to be right, um, has their life ruined by people who are out to get them rather than canceling being a consequence that like flows logically from someone's views or behavior being seen as a mismatch with their role or making them less appealing or trustworthy. So I just think they're coming into this the wrong way and with the wrong set of values and with the wrong understanding um, about what it would mean for John to be quote unquote canceled. Yes, this is through the looking glass. And one of the reasons why quote unquote cancel culture gets a bad rap is that people feel like it's because of this. Mm -hmm. That it's not about what they've done. It's about this, like, petty revenge thing, right? And that's actually not what it should be. Like, if you, I don't know, are a comedian who masturbates in front of your uh, colleagues, you're not being canceled out of revenge. You're being canceled because you're a creepy dude, right? Right, and people don't want to work with you anymore. Right? But the idea is, like, oh, you're just revenge, right? And this person is saying, like, Yes, I'm in it for the revenge, which is, as you say, exactly the wrong reasons. Right? Exactly. Now, look, the letter doesn't tell us quite enough, right? Mm-hmm. Because I don't know what the social media post from John was. I don't know what John's actions are. Like, and so my, my, my thought here is, is, is always this. Is the person that you are, quote unquote, canceling a danger mm-hmm. to you or others? Mm-hmm. Right? It, are their views? Are their is their history? Is their story the kind of thing that they will do harm to others be, with using a position of power um, right. to do harm to others? Right. Right. If so, then you have arguably a moral duty to speak up. Mm-hmm. If not, if you're not worried that this guy is going to actually do harm to people, you just don't like him and you want to get him back then no, you keep your mouth shut. I mean, clearly the letter writer is mostly animated by thinking John was wrong and mean in the past and gave Brad too hard of a time and the same thing should happen to him. Right. And I, I want to give them credit for working for a social justice organization. But I have to say that nowhere in the letter is there a hint of any concern for the potential impact of John's views about minority groups on the organization's work. That right? would be the big thing, right? Like you said, the, right? the power and the potential harm, not even mentioned. And since that's not mentioned, I kind of think that that's not what this is really about. Mm-hmm. The other thing that I think is important to address is the anonymous thing, right? Mm-hmm. Because first of all, the spouse, 100% right, there is no anonymous. Mm. Like you might think it's an, but it's not. At, they'll figure it out and you always have to operate from the perception that your anonymous tip, quote, media would that it will be found out. <laughs> Wait a minute. Right? So I actually, I was imagining creating a fake Gmail address, <laughs> taking a screenshot of the post and sending it to the board of directors. Do you think they would, they would find him out? I mean, look, there's a way Tom Cruise could do this, right? Like, there's uh-huh. a way that, 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 that agent Ethan Hunt could figure this out to do it. <laughs> right. But you random person working for a social justice organization probably don't have those, you know, like ghost recon skills, right? Like you have to at least assume that your tip will be discovered. Mm -hmm. But more than that, if this John is really a danger, if this John is really a problem, sign your name to it. Mm. Because I feel, and I can't prove this just based on the letter, But I feel that part of this person's uh, impulse imperative is that maybe this person didn't stand up for Brad quite as much as they should have back when Brad was going through whatever Brad went through. Mm -hmm. And maybe if you had stood up, signed your name to it and said, no, Brad's a good guy. You know, I, I, I see this bad history. I understand. But I know Brad and I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with Brad right now. Right. Maybe that would have, uh, uh, not saying would have saved Brad's job, but maybe it would have made you feel better. Mm-hmm. Right. And look, part of this is like, this is the, the male bias talking. I understand it's, it's different. It is fundamentally less dangerous for me. Yeah. Um, to sign my name to, to some of these things. And, you know, so again, we don't know what's in the letter. There are certainly versions of that 
where it's just it's harder to do it if you're a woman and I and I'm trying to be respectful and, and appreciate that. But in broad strokes in general, I don't think anonymous is the way to go if you're actually saying that this person's the danger to the organization, to other people who work there, whatever. I think you do sign your name to it. I think you do stand up and you say like, no, this guy should go. Yeah, so I think the message to the letter writer is you need to do some soul searching. Um, we don't have all the details. What did John say? What did he say about this particular group? How does that line up with and potentially interfere with his ability to lead an organization that includes members of that group and potentially serves members of that group? I'm thinking, I mean, I haven't read it, but I'm troubled by it. I'm, I'm thinking it's probably pretty bad. Um, the letter writer did say it was worse than what Brad said. So as someone who um, doesn't really care about John, doesn't really care about Brad, doesn't really care about the letter writer, I generally care about members of racial minority groups not being treated poorly because of who they are. So with just that perspective and the information we have, I do think it needs to be shared. Before I spoke to you, I was thinking, you know, I had my anonymous Gmail account, send it to the board of directors, let them decide plan. Um, but I actually think you've convinced me that letter writer, if you look at the facts and if you can muster some actual care for the potential victims of John's worldview here, then yeah. Yeah. Stand up and, and, and be proud to say it, not to punish him for what he did to Brad, but to protect other people, if you can even get yourself into that frame of mind. That's kind of where I come down. You're listening to The Dear Prudence Show, and when we come back, we'll be reading more of your letters. Stay with us. Welcome back to Dear Prudence. I'm here with my guest, Ellie, to answer your letters. And the next one is titled, Possibly Irrational in PA. I, 30 female, am expecting my first child, a girl, with my partner of three years, 31 male. We have a lot of familial support on both sides, as both my and my partner's parents live less than an hour away, and my older siblings, 36 male and 32 female, are both parents themselves, so we have received a lot of advice and offers to help from all. However, there's one piece of advice that I can't stop stressing about. My brother's wife and I met for lunch last week, and I asked if she and my brother were considering a preschool for their three-year-old daughter. She looked almost shocked and said she planned to never leave her daughter at a preschool or with a babysitter who wasn't her mother or my mother. Basically, that you can never be sure that someone isn't going to abuse your kids. She was barely trusting my mom as is, but she had made my brother search his childhood for any problematic memories to vet her. Her kids will never be allowed for a sleepover or a playdate that ends after 6 p.m. in a house with older boys or men, and moms in today's world who do otherwise are sending their kids into trauma. Before this, I thought of her as mildly uptight, but a good sister-in-law and friend overall. Now I keep thinking about what she said, and I feel guilty that I had already been planning ahead for future date nights by getting contact info for a neighbor's daughter who babysits, and planning when to get on preschool and daycare wait lists. Both my partner and I were lucky enough to grow up in loving homes and tight-knit communities where slumber parties and babysitting meant pizza and movies with another kind person who was taking care of us. And I get told a lot that I'm an optimist. So I'm wondering, if sister-in-law's views are actually right and I have too much faith in others— is this seemingly intense point of view actually right? Should I bring it up to my partner or address what sister-in-law said at all? Help! So, Ellie, you're a parent. Indeed. Before we get to what the letter writer should say to her husband or her sister-in-law, I just kind of want to unpack the underlying issue, which is basically... Should you protect kids from sexual abuse by keeping them close to home? I'm torn about it. W what do you make of it? It's a false choice. Mm. It's a classic false choice. The, the sister-in-law has set up a ridiculous situation where either you smother your child and allow them to only see one or two kind of FBI approved people <laughs> or they get raped, right? Like there's no, like just that's the two, two options, right? And it is a classic false choice. The first thing that I wanted to say to the sister-in-law um, is do you drive? Mm. 
Mm, I thought do of the you same drive thing. with your children in the car? Because statistically speaking, the most dangerous thing you do with your children is put them in the backseat of a car and get on the road. Statistically mm-hmm. speaking. Right? So, like, I'm pretty sure she drives. I'm pretty sure she takes them to the Costco. And, like, that's worse. That Statistically, that is way more dangerous than hiring a babysitter. Now, I don't want to, I'm not saying that I'm cavalier about this issue. I have kids, they're boys. I understand that's going to be a little bit different depending on, I understand that for some people that mean, that's going to mean that's a little bit different. But like, I bet it the holy hell out of any babysitter or caretaker that we had, right? Like, I did my due diligence. I, you know, called the references, you know, I set up the nanny camp. Like, I did the things, right? But at the end of the day, like, you have to, trust uh, it's not obviously your kids are too young to trust them you have to trust yourself Mm -hmm. you have to trust your own judgment because you can't you can't sit on your kids like you're like like a hen on top of an egg Mm -hmm. um uh, uh uh forever right eventually they're gonna have to go to to school right my kid right now as we record this is on a two day overnight school sponsored field trip right it's just he's in fifth grade mm-hmm. got, gotta be done right, right. what am i gonna show up right <laughs> <laughs> like hide in the like buy a different cabin in the woods and, and with binoculars like no it's gotta happen right and look every parent is going to be different about when that's gonna happen and if you you know i'm glad the sister-in-law has the luxury of being the personal caretaker to her kids the entire time. A lot of parents don't have that luxury. A lot of parents have to rely on daycare, preschool, whatever, because they have to go to work. So I'm glad that the sister-in-law has that luxury. But even with that luxury, eventually you're going to have to put your trust and uh, of their care in somebody else. Right. So I think... <sighs> I don't want to dismiss it as like, it's a cultural difference. By culture, I'm not referring to like a certain race or ethnic group. It's just like a the way you grew up and what you think is valuable difference. Um, I think there are just, there's so many areas in which you're going to have to strike a balance between protecting your child from harm and letting them live life. But living life is defined by your family's culture and your definition of what living life is, right? So I can see from the letter writer's point of view, sleepovers and having babysitters are part of childhood. From the sister-in-law's perspective, maybe they're not, you know? To be fair, I also know some people who are afraid to drive with their kids in the car, right? And maybe that's not an important part of life to them. I actually, I reached out to a friend who I know is like a pretty protective parent to ask her if her daughter was allowed to have sleepovers. Um, I know the daughter goes to school and like daycare, obviously, but I was more interested in the sleepover part. And she said, she's not allowed to have sleepovers with anyone other than her grandparents, unless we're also there. We also won't allow sleepovers at our house unless all the males in our house are not present. We have explained to her the things that can can and have happened at sleepovers where we cannot control who comes in and out of their house, uncles, brothers, friends, et cetera. Also, no one will be falsely accusing any males in my house of anything if they're home. And I'm like, I want things to go well for my friend and her child too. And if this costs her nothing, I was kind of like, I support it. My my weird thing on that, my, my, my version of that is, you know, I ask other parents before my kid goes over for a play date, you know, if they have guns in the house. Yes. Yeah, because I'm not about to let my kid go to some even for you know a couple hours <clears throat> to go to some house that has guns in the house, right? Um, because again, statistically, I know how dangerous that is. Mm-hmm. So again, I think for I think the line for every parent is gonna be different, but I think that the but but where I react kind of strongly to this again to the sister in law is this idea that nobody can be trusted, mm. right? Like that, that's just not sustainable mm-hmm. kind of as they get older long-term. That's not sustainable in terms of allowing the child themselves to grow and learn and experience and, ad- and adapt, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so like you're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to cut that apron string at some point. Maybe you don't have to do it when they're two because you're privileged and you can do it all yourself, right? Right. 
But when they're five, when they're 10, when they're at some point, you're going to have to cut it. It's just a question of when. And that's kind of how I roll back into to, to the actual letter writer, right? Mm-hmm. Because like the sister-in-law is off on her own thing. Right, and, she's you know, allowed to do it. She, right, she's fine. Good, yeah. Good luck to her. You're right. Um, in terms of the letter writer, certainly when I was a new parent, right? Like you get all kinds of parenting advice from all kinds yes. of people. And one of the dangers I always kind of was struggling against is that the most strict, the most stringent, the most safe advice always seems like the right one, right? right. Because like in a vacuum, why would you not do the most safe thing, right? right? And if you, and so if anybody else has like an even better safety strategy, why wouldn't you do it, right? Yeah. In a vacuum from the perspective of an expecting parent. Man, the, the thing that I would like say to the letter writer is like, Life comes at you fast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these, like, safety tips, concern things, um, those fall away as the reality of your life kind of happens, right? Mm -hmm. She specifically referred to the looking up babysitters for date nights, right? Now, it's fine to say in the abstract, oh, we'll just never have a date night. Yeah. But, you know, six months, a year, it's 18 months later. You might want a date night. Right. And there's only one way to do it. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that and that reality is going to hit you and it's going to change your perceptions of what is reasonable and what is not. And so my advice to the letter writer is just go with it. Like, like tr- again, trust yourself. Don't trust other people. Trust yourself. Trust your judgment. Um, and have that be kind of the – have that be the story of you. I've made, you know – with two kids, you make horrible mistakes with the two kids. I, I, for a long time, I, you know, I, I wrote, the kid was home. I was kind of trying to write and caretake at the same time. Nightmare. Right. And it's, it was very difficult. And I kind of got to the point where it's like, okay, the kid is fine. You know, when they were kind of crawling around, okay, the kid is fine in one room when I'm fine in my writing office and I can do, you know, 10 minutes and I'll be fine. And I came back 10 minutes later and the kid had his hand this deep in the de-icing salt bucket oh, no. <laughs> that I had accidentally laid out. And I was like, shit, yeah. I killed my child <laughs> today. How did I call poison control? I mean, like, so you're going to make mistakes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, things, things are going to happen. But, like, the reality is going to – my point with that story is that reality will catch up with you fast. Right. I like what you said about trusting yourself. And I think that was sort of the the center of the advice I came up with, too. If you don't have a clear sense of your values and the ability to listen to your own instincts um, or a plan to turn to particular experts and decide what, when to evolve and change your mind, you will go absolutely insane as a parent. Um, mm-hmm. There's I mean, the decisions from everything from feeding to sleep to screen time, toys, um, dyes and food, activities, allowances. Are they allowed to walk to school by themselves? Can they take the bus? Uh, Can they have a phone? Can they be on social media? Like there are always going to be these decisions. And I worry for the letter writer that if she is easily swayed by other people's perspectives, She's going to be one of those moms who is like sent into a depression spiral by Instagram because it Mm. seems like everyone else has it figured out and it seems like everyone else is perfect. And like you will lose your mind trying to chase what everyone does because everyone's doing it differently according to their own values. Um, You've got to just kind of I, I actually think for me, once I had my child, my instincts were super strong. I wasn't conflicted about a lot. And the letter writer might feel the same. Like once the child is in front of you, you might just have a sense that you know what the right thing for them is in the context of your family. But um, you've letter writer, you've, you've got to develop a clear perspective and some confidence in yourself, or you're going to be having these dilemmas for the next eighteen years from yeah, now, now about, until prom night. About things, you know, about things ridiculously small. Yeah. Um. You 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 can talk yourself into um into a fetal position about things ridiculously small. I, I happen to be 
um, amongst my friend group and amongst, you know, even uh, the, the parents at school. I'm the screen time dad. I'm the like, mm-hmm. I am not actually very worried about screen time. I, I I have all these rules in place about it. But I, as far as I know, I am like more pro screen time than kind of any other parent that I kind of regularly come in contact with. And so, at, you know, one, I was kind of explaining this and kid was in, I want to say, uh, like kindergarten or, or, or first grade. And they were kind of, another parent was kind of shocked that I had just like given the kid the iPad and, and, you know, whatever. And so I was explaining my theory and the parent just looked me dead in the face and was just like, well, I guess we'll see if he grows up to be a serial killer or not. <laughs> I was like, I guess we will. <laughs> like, like the, the, like the parents will, parents will get into your soul and like, Find your weak place and crush right. it. Because you're so vulnerable. It's the thing you care about most in the world. Right. So you do have to, again, you have to develop a confidence in yourself, in your judgment, and, you know, in the judgment, I think, also of your partner. I, I kind of started the this talking about, you know, the importance of arguing. But, like, you know, part of the reason why it's good to argue is that you develop a real trust for the other person's sensibilities, right? And so there are things that, like, I wouldn't be comfortable with that my wife is able to convince me to be comfortable with. There are things mm-hmm. that she wouldn't be comfortable with that I'm able to convince her to be comfortable with. But, you know, we have a, a, a plan and a strategy and we work together um, to try to find for the first, for the second kid, it's like, uh, whatever. <laughs> Enjoy the bag of salt. Right. <laughs> Didn't kill the first one. Ain't going to kill you. Like, you're <laughs> but, but for the first kid, you really do have to develop a, internal sense of confidence. So yeah, the question, should you bring it up with your partner? Absolutely, yes. Because it's worth starting to figure out if you're on the same page. But with enough humility to allow room for the fact that you both might change with new hormones, new emotions, meeting this new little person, new information, new studies, new anecdotal evidence. I think it's most important to identify what your core values are for your child and start from there. One one last story. So in the what to expect while expecting phase, mm-hmm. my wife starts buying the the, the plug covers, the, mm-hmm. the baby proof plug covers, and I was going full like 1950s sitcom that this is ridiculous. We don't need the plug covers. What's going to happen? They're going to stick their finger in the plug, and that's how they learn. Like I was full that, uh-huh. and my little beautiful cherub crawled near a plug yeah. once. I was like, "Where's the plug covers?" <laughs> oh my god, please tell me you bought the blood cover. Right. People change when it's in when it's real. People and change. again, let give yourself the grace to do that. Yeah, I thought my kid wouldn't have sugar until he was two because I read that that was a thing and like I wanted to be healthy. And over the weekend, I was like trying to force feed him mango sorbet because he had a cold and hadn't eaten. He didn't want it. I was like, eat it, please. Um, Anyway, yeah, so things change. Um, You do not need to emulate your sister-in-law. She's going to do her own thing. But this is a great opportunity to open up a conversation with your partner about what you are going to do. This is Dear Prudence. We need to take a break, but when we come back, more letters from you and advice from us. Stay tuned. I'm Janae and you're listening to Dear Prudence. Ellie and I are about to tackle our last question for the day. Ellie, are you ready? I am so ready. This letter is titled, Sick of It. I'm a generally healthy person and not at high risk for complications from COVID, but it doesn't mean I want to get it again or any other illness for that matter. I'm glad life activities have pretty much returned to pre-pandemic routines, and I understand that there is always risk in picking up a bug in public spaces because not everyone knows when they've got something contagious and some people don't have much choice about going to work or doing other essential tasks while sick. Hopefully they mask. But I can't wrap my head around why so many people are showing up sick to social events, exercise classes, or even offices where working from home is allowed. Part of me is angry at others for being so inconsiderate, but the part I struggle with most is feeling anxious and sometimes trapped next to a sick person, like when they start hacking and blowing their nose in the middle of a yoga class, or complaining about their body aches at dinner. Am I overreacting? Is there something I can say or do in these situations besides mask up or leave? 
I can't understand why no one else seems bothered. And it really sucks the fun out of whatever we're doing to be hyper vigilant about other people's coughs. So is there something I can say or do besides mask up and leave? I don't think so. Unless Ellie has a better idea. I don't think so. I was sure the pandemic would create a situation in which we all became just more aware of spreading germs in general um, and more conscientious about it. Like, I just knew that we were never going to blow out candles on birthday cake again because we had this new awareness that, like, (laughs) spit particles come out of your mouth and they land on things and that's how germs are spread. But nope, we're back to blowing out candles. 100%. This is sort of like the other question we discussed about parenting. There's no such thing about overreacting when it's your concern for you or your loved one's health and safety, but you are overreacting in relation to the reality of living in the world and how other people are going to behave. Look, I think what the pandemic has shown is that if we actually stayed six feet apart from each other and wore masks, we would be a much healthier society. And Mm -hmm. our refusal to do that shows that we are actually a gross and disgusting society. (laughs) Um, that has no problem with communicable diseases and spreading our filth around. Now, Janae, you will notice that I have not said anything particularly political so far today, but this is one mm-hmm. place where I just have to, have to emphasize that if you are concerned with sick people in public kind of ruining your fun, this is why labor is so important. This is why supporting um, politicians who will support labor is so important because so many of the people out in public who are sick are out there because they have to be, because they don't have the option to stay home and get healthy um, before they come to work. Obviously, your question was more focused on social events, but I think it's still a connection because once you put yourself in the position where you know you have to go to work anywhere, where you know you have to, no matter Mm -hmm. how sick or gross or or ill you feel, you got to drag your ass to work anyway, well, then why wouldn't you drag your ass to the movie? Right. Why wouldn't you drag your ass to dinner? Why wouldn't you go to the ball game? Right. If you don't if you're not sick enough to miss work, why are you supposed to be sick enough to miss fun? And also, like, your social companions might have gotten sick because someone else who they work with was sick and couldn't miss work. So I think that's amazing, concrete, really, really, really smart advice. Um, Much more satisfying than what I was going to give. But I still so you came at it from the political angle. I'm going to come at it from the pretending to be a therapist without a license angle. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I once had a therapist say to me that in romantic relationships, when you find yourself worrying, can I really, really trust this person? How can I be sure things will work out? What if I get hurt? How can I be positive? They won't hurt me. If you focus less on those unanswerable questions that will just cause you so much stress because anyone could hurt you or leave you, and more on making sure that you're equipped to be okay no matter what happens, um, you'll be much happier. So I think this is similar because it's going to be really frustrating to be looking around the world every day going, are other people being responsible? Are they going to get me sick? Are they being inconsiderate? Do they have body aches? Are they sneezing? And every day people are going to be doing things that risk hurting you. A healthier way to approach it might be to think about what do I have in place to decrease the chances of getting sick and also to be as sure as possible that getting sick will be something that I can manage. So whether that's like, like you said, masking, perhaps like skipping certain events that seem like they will be super spreader moments, having your illness supplies at home, having your little pulse finger thing that we all had during the pandemic at home, keeping track of how many sick days you have. If you live alone, um, setting up a friend who will be the one to bring you stuff deciding um, in advance what symptoms will cause you to go to urgent care or see your doctor. Um, It might just help emotionally to feel like you're more in control and you're more prepared for the worst case scenario that, yes, one of these people is eventually going to put you in. Look, I I like the pandemic insofar as that it turned out I have a little bit of the Emily Dickinson in me, right? Like, (laughs) you know, kind of having living in my own personal fortress and not having to interact with people. Um, was actually great. I, I I can entertain myself just fine uh, mm-hmm. um, without going to some of these um, events. And the other thing, and we've talked about kids so much in this episode, but like it was also that the little 
petri dish disease vectors that mm-hmm. our children were also kind of self-contained, right? Because most of the times that I get sick, it's not from somebody on the subway or somebody in, you know, in Times Square. It's from my kids coming home from school, right? And again, yeah. like kids got to go to school. Sometimes kids are going to be sick when they go to school. We know kids are notoriously bad at personal hygiene. That's just part of being a child. And so they they bring the diseases home. And a lot of times they're fine and the, and the parents are the ones who get sick. And that's still pre-COVID and post-COVID. That's where like 90% of my illnesses come from. And, yeah. you know, also sometimes I go to Vegas and play poker and then I come back. And <laughs> get bro- everyone both sick. broke and sick. But other than that... <laughs> right it's usually the children so you know you're gonna be exposed to illness and i think that the frustrating thing and i get this get the frustration from the letter is that we figured out how to stop a lot of it right we actually figured out how to stop a lot of disease spread and it is with social distancing and it is with masking and it is with people washing their hands and it is with people staying home and quarantining when they're feeling uh, ill, right? Like we actually figured out how to stop this. We just don't care anymore. Right. And or people have decided that it's more important for them to just live life. Or um, the bigger issue, I think, is the one you pointed out before. A lot of people don't have a choice. Right. And so we are now in that situation where we know how to stop it, but have chosen not to. And I get that frustration. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes feel it too. Um, but there, but there's nothing you can say to, you have to understand you're not fighting an individual person with a cough. You're right. fighting a societal kind of construct. Right. It might feel better to focus on that one societal construct and less on the 57 people you interact with every single day, because that's a lot of instances of frustration if you're going to feel it about every individual. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Those are all the questions we have for this week. It's been fun and hopefully helpful. Ellie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. You can read Ellie's writing at The Nation and follow him on Twitter at E-L-I-E-N-Y-C. Do you need help getting along with partners, relatives, coworkers, or people in general? Write to me. Go to slate.com forward slash P-R-U-D-I-E. That's slate.com forward slash P-R-U-D-I-E. The Dear Prudence column publishes every Thursday. If you would like to hear your question answered on the podcast, we are looking for letter writers who would be comfortable recording their questions for the show. You can, of course, stay anonymous. Dear Prudence is produced by Sierra Spragley Ricks with a special thanks to Brandon Nix. Editorial help from Paola de Verona. Daisy Rosario is the senior supervising producer, and Alicia Montgomery is Slate's VP of Audio. I'm your dear Prudence, Janae Desmond-Harris. Until next time.